action. <laughs> we need our clapper. So we just got back from an amazing weekend. We got to spend time with a bunch of like-minded business people and um, people who are just on the same wavelength in terms of business growth and 10xing and all that good stuff. So with that being said, I wanted to ask you guys a little bit more about some of the interactions that I observed while you were um, chatting with people throughout the weekend. And one of the things that I noticed that you were mentioning a lot is kind of an explanation of our name, right? Like, what does Plurthlings mean, right? What, what does it mean and why is that our name and all that good stuff. So with that being said, if you guys could please tell me what plurth and plurthlings means to you personally, I would love to start there. Monsoon? Okay, so plurth started because we both got into the rave scene about the same time. And plur is the all time, I think it's going on 30 plus, 30 plus years now of being in the, in the rave culture, which simply means peace, love, unity, and respect. And we've always felt that that was always bigger and could be bigger than the rave scene itself, that it desperately needs to get outside of the festival walls and reach the entire planet. Because, I mean, especially right now, and especially for the last several years, if not decades, uh, the earth needs peace, love, unity, and respect just as much as we do while we're at a, an event or a festival. And so we always want, wanted to take peace, love, unity, and respect outside of the festival to the rest of the earth. And then it kind of dawned on us like plur and earth have this similar start to it. And so we're like, hey, why not call it plurth? And let's be plurthlings. And to me personally, peace, love, unity, and respect for the earth and all earthlings means sustainability. Uh, being able to be sustainable and be good to the earth and the environment, but also to the economy and to society as a whole, that we, we all need a little bit of peace, love, unity, and respect. And to, to me, that's achievable with sustainability, especially thinking about the next seven generations after us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well said. Kahu, what does plurth and plurthlings mean to you? So I think the funny thing about how Plurthlings came about is we actually went through this really intense marketing course and we were getting really serious about our business and there was this whole section on building your avatar and picking who your target demographic is for what it is you're trying to build a business to market to. And we came up with this avatar and we actually called our fan base Plurthlings at first. So we were a completely different project at the time and we were calling our fans Plurthlings or these this group of people that we wanted to market our music to, basically. And so that's kind of how the idea of Plurthlings came about. And then we got to a point where we were just like, well, why don't we just call ourselves that? Because we never wanted there to be a difference between us and our fans. Like we want to be one team and one unit. We don't want to be these guys up on a pedestal. Like we've always joked that the way we dress and the way we act and the, the, the music that we take is there's going to be a stage manager at some point when we get to the big stages across the world that there might be a stage manager somewhere at some point in time that goes how did how did these ravers get on stage or what are you guys doing back here because we look like the crowd looks because that's kind of the funny thing about DJs is there's definitely a separation between how DJs look and act and how the crowd looks and act because the crowd is very bright and vibrant and they have correlating outfits on to their favorite artists and we wanted to be and build a project that that synergy existed between us and the fans. There's not a separation, but we are the fans because at the end of the day, like we are ravers. Like we started doing this because we we started going to festivals and just fell in love with the people and the music and the vibe and everything that is involved with it. So that's what it means to me is creating 
a cohesive community that works towards something together and not only at the rave because like my whole thing and I think Monsoon agrees with me is what's really frustrating about leaving festivals is it's like there's this family and there's this oneness and there's all of this cool stuff that's happening and then on the end of day two or day three everybody jumps in their cars and it's like all out the window like people are road raging each other and yelling at each other and getting in fights in the parking lot and it's like wait weren't we just all hanging out practicing plur basically and having fun together and taking care of each other because that's really the magic that happens at festivals so for us it's taking that that vibe and that feeling that you have that together and that oneness with the crowd and taking it outside of the rave and implementing it into the real world the, the real world i'll say it with quotes but taking it one step further and living your everyday life with those values, not just the three days that you're at a festival. Awesome. Now tell me a little bit more about why you guys do what you do with the Plurth Project. So for example, why are you DJs making music? So we always saw DJing and music as a vehicle to reach our end goal, which is taking that success, that influence, and that revenue that we make as artists, because I think we all know, like, that Forbes article of the top 10 DJs in the world, like, there's a lot of wealth that is created by this community of people, whether it's to the promoters, to the event companies, to the DJs, there's just a lot of wealth in that community. And we always saw it as a vehicle to take that wealth and those resources and implement it in a way that makes the world a better place, like investing in sustainable technologies, specifically vertical agriculture and real estate development, because this guy is, you know, he went to college for real estate development. So when I met him, he dropped this bomb on me and it was a no brainer. So, you know, I'll let him run with it a little bit next. But like when he told me his plan of like vertical agriculture funded by music and events and parties so we can make it cool. Like I was 100% on board from the moment I heard that. I don't, I don't think that anybody in our path has made a decision on how cool that was quicker than what I was, how I did it. But yeah, so that's, that's what I always viewed it as, as, as a vehicle to create wealth and create an abundance of resources so that we could take that and not only make it cool, but, pay for the types of things that make the world a better place. Awesome. And Monsoon, tell me a little bit more about that goal, that what you talked to Kahu about in your early, his early college days, your mid to late college days. Tell me more about the the goal and who really that is going to impact. Okay, so I was going to school at Arizona State where I eventually met him for real estate development. And in 2004, 2003 through 2008, when I was there, uh, the big focus was on sustainability because that was during the big housing boom of the early 2000s. And real estate was kind of getting out of control and it was becoming unsustainable really quickly. And I had this passion for music, but real estate seemed to be where everything was going. But then I graduated in 2008, which was historically one of the worst years, if not the worst year in history for real estate in America. And it was tough. So I decided to pursue music full time. And that was after I had a deal for $27 million to produce my own festival tour. And that fell through at the same time as well. But what it showed me is that it was possible. It could happen. And my original idea and intent was that a festival is like a, a little mini city that, you know, you need to provide food and water and restrooms and security and safety and pretty much everything a city needs just on a smaller scale, but not too much smaller. I mean, some of these festivals, you know, over 50,000 people, over 100,000. I mean, some are over several hundred thousand people. I mean, that's bigger than the city I was in at the time, which was Tempe, Arizona, which only you know, has, I think under a hundred thousand or, you know, it could be different now, but 
the fact of the matter is a festival is a lot of people and providing all those services over a weekend or a week is very intense on the local infrastructure where the festival takes place. And so the idea of the tour was to come through and show local communities how we can make a festival tour sustainable and showcase all these technologies and things, but also use the proceeds and the profits to fund those types of services and utilities in their own local communities. And so that's kind of what started. I was like, hey, a festival is like a little city. If we can prove that sustainability can work in this environment, it can work in a, in a city all year, all year round. And so when the real estate crash happened, I was like, hey, I'm going to focus on music because I, I want to play music at these festivals too, because I've been playing music since 1995. And I thought, hey, I'm going to work on the music side of things. And then eventually the economy will recover. And, you know, here we are uh, 13 years later. And I think people are really excited again about sustainability, given what's all going on in the world and stuff. We need sustainability more than than ever. And that's where I think the peace, love, unity, and respect can really grow out of the festival scene. But still, we can use festivals as a way to teach, to show people, because that's kind of one of the big responses we get from when we uh, say things like this, is people go, well, festivals aren't sustainable at all. You know, there's trash everywhere. And, you know, they're spending all this on energy and burning gasoline and all this stuff. But the point is, we don't have to do these things that way because a lot of these things use construction equipment from real estate development just to put on a festival. There should be specific things and technologies in place at these festivals so we don't have to borrow from the construction industry. But even then, the construction industry is becoming more sustainable day by day as well. And so we need to kind of merge the two together and realize that festivals are simply a short-term real estate deal that we can if we can make them festival, which we, we can, we can make a festival sustainable. If we can do that, the cities will follow. I don't, I don't think it can happen the other way around. You know, if we can't make a festival sustainable, we have no business in making a city sustainable. And uh, touching on what he said is that sustainability is like, you would think 13 years later, it'd be like super cool. Uh, like everybody's talking about it and, and doing stuff about it. But still here we are not meeting our climate goals of that the governments have set in place. And I really think it's because it's boring. You know, it's a bunch of stuffy guys and gals in like the UN just debating all this politics about it. And really it just needs to be cool because if the younger generation thought sustainability was cool, and I feel like they think it's cooler than most generations do because they, I think they're acutely aware that their future is in jeopardy to a degree. And so with our music, when we're DJing, the, the lyrics we use, uh, even if it's not our own songs, if we're just playing other people's songs, we really try to take that into account. How can we help people along this path to learning about sustainability, make them think it's cool? Because it is cool. It's, it literally could be the foundation of, of everything. And so I believe music is the one thing that can bring us together, that the festivals can show how to do it right, and then the rest of the world will follow. That was... Really eye-opening. Thank you so much for your insight on that. Um, definitely brings a lot of awareness, I think, having these conversations about sustainability and how it's um, part of something that we can incorporate already that people don't think about. So another question that I saw you get often throughout the weekend and another thing that was brought up often was community. So what exactly are the next steps with the Plurth project? After going to the Undercover Billionaire Boot Camp at Wake Up Pueblo, one of my big takeaways was that whole community that was brought together was basically brought together by the foundation of Matt and Jenny Smith. And they seem like they are so passionate about their local community in Pueblo and what that created was a foundation for an entirely like global community to gather at their location at one point. So I was just really inspired to kind of brainstorm and figure out what I could do with the local community. So I found a 
local t-shirt printing shop that I'm going to reach out to to see if they would be willing to do something. Um, I'm already a member of the local chamber of commerce because of my uh, side hustle as a mortgage lender. So I'm already plugged into the community in a way and we've done multiple fundraisers. We did Coats for Colorado. We sponsored a family for Christmas and they had a pretty amazing Christmas (laughs) because we have about 10 or 12 people in my leads group and we all pitched in and we gave them a little bit of money and we gave them presents and stuff like that. So I think leaning into that side of things, but with our brand and plugging our brand into the local community and showing up as Plurthlings versus mortgage lender guy, um, I think will really, really benefit because I mean, a lot of those business owners are are super cool and I've had a, a chance to to speak with them one on one a couple of times, and I kind of go through my pitch. At first, I was real. I, I wear my hair back and I wear normal clothes, and through conversation, I just I would let them know I, I make music. I've been a professional DJ for ten years, and the response to that is actually much different than I thought it would be. I thought people would kind of be like, "Whoa, who's this crazy party guy?" But people were actually really intrigued and really supportive. So. I think, you know, we could DJ at Parker Days or <laughs> um, DJ some of the, the business events because we I just had so much fun this weekend. It was a, a, we went out of our comfort zone for sure. And we DJed this business networking event and everybody loved it. Like and it was awkward for us because we had definitely had to kind of tone it down. Like usually we like to bring the party and go big or go home. But we definitely dj to the room and we weren't too loud and we weren't too crazy and people were coming up to us all weekend and telling us how awesome the music is so in a roundabout way it plugged us into the community and pueblo isn't too far from where we're at so i really would like to spend more time there i mean i got approached to dj their farmers market over the summer and i guess they have a a big river walk event that we got invited to so I think just doing more stuff like that and humbling myself to be like, okay, this isn't a huge festival. There's not going to be 200,000 people there, but it's doing a service to the community with the skills we have. And I think that that's really what makes me excited is being accepted for who I am and the skills I have and being able to share that with the local community versus a global community like a festival. That's really exciting to hear that you guys are going to be getting more into the local community and giving back and um, donating your talents and time to, you know, even a local farmer's market or, um, you know, some of the shelters and things like that that are in and around the Denver area and Colorado as a whole, because I know that we have built a strong community with Pueblo as well. So um, I commend you guys for the next steps that you have planned out. Monsoon, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, so what or how would you define, um, or I guess explain to me a little bit, like what the American dream looks like to you? The American dream is definitely still alive. That's what I learned this past weekend at the uh, Undercover Billionaire Boot Camp. Seeing all the business leaders there, And when you think of Plurth, I want you to think of sustainability, making sustainability cool because we don't need any more technology. It's already there. We just need people to invest in it, Uh, whether that's with time or money or with music, like with us. And one of the things I've learned about sustainability that a lot of people don't know is that it's not just the environment, ecology. It's ecology, economy, but also one other thing, which is equality. And these three things must be balanced together in order to reach true sustainability. Whereas, like I said, most people think it's just about the environment only. But the reason it also has to do with equality and economy is because if you don't have the right resources, you can only see short term. And sustainability is a long term game. And so if you don't have the right resources, it's tough to be there saying, hey, I'm going to make the decision to spend more money to be sustainability or sustainable versus my short term of saving some money. And maybe I have to buy products and services that aren't as sustainable. 
And it's kind of ridiculous just to begin with that sustainability costs more when in reality it should cost less. So what I've learned is the average person in America or the rest of the world might not be able to make the right choices because of where they're at in life. However, when you look at businesses and business leaders, like the people in that room, they have the ability to make the right choices for their business, for themselves, their families, and for all their employees and partners, because they're in a position with resources that they can make these kind of decisions. So to me, the American dream is business and entrepreneurs being able to make the right decisions for the next seven generations so that their business is not just a short-term business, but a long-term business. And then they can start in spite by the moves they make to be more sustainable and support more renewable resources. The community that forms around them can actually start making those choices too. Cause the, the abundance, you know, uh, what were they saying? The, uh, uh, a rising tide raises all ships, right? And so we need these business leaders, I think, first to make the right sustainable choices so that the people working for them, working with them, and the communities that they serve can also start making these choices. And so to me, the American dream is having the freedom to do whatever you want, but knowing what the right things are to do for the, the survival of not just America, but the, for the rest of the world. Because no matter what, America is a part of the rest of the world. And so being America, we're so such a big country that's so influential. We really need to rein in on our sustainable uh, choices so that the rest of the world will follow. And so, yeah, the American dream to me uh, in the modern age, I think, has turned to meaning sustainability and, and creating that wealth and abundance uh, renewably for everybody. OK, nice. Thank you. Um, I got a question from Noodle. <laughs> he said this is for both of you. And he wants to know what your superpower is. So we'll start with Kahu. Kahu, what is your superpower? Noodle needs to know. Oh, uh, man. I wasn't Are we even... talking about in our movie or in real life? <laughs> I wasn't even prepared we to answer that. We will talk about in real life for now. <laughs> Um, I would say my ability to step up as a leader and really lead by example and do the things that I'm uncomfortable doing so that I can show the people around me that if I can do it, they can do it. And, um, I also would throw in that with that comes the, the talent of persuasion, <laughs> I I feel like uh I've got the gift of gab when it comes to to sales and marketing and trying to explain the benefits of what I'm trying to educate somebody on whether it's sustainability or a product or service I'm trying to get a sale on but yeah Nice the power <laughs> of persuasion Persuasion the P, and the PP <laughs> P.O.P. Okay. Pers okay, P.O.P. The yeah. pop. Yeah. Your superpower he brings the pop. is the pop. I bring okay. the pop, yeah. That's actually really cool. Persuasion and influence. Yep, I love it. All right, Monsoon, tell Noodle, because he's dying to know, what is your superpower? Okay, so Kahu here is definitely more leaning towards an, an, an extrovert. Um, but as we know, we make music and in order to make good music, you kind of have to be an introvert. And that's kind of where I lean more. And so my superpower, I think, is being able to put in long hours and not go to sleep somehow. And, you know, make sure our DJ mixes are prepared for the shows, which, you know, takes time. Make sure the mixing and mastering is done properly. Uh, put, putting together the, the scripts, doing all that kind of like long term type stuff and and not giving up staying focused on it and yeah so i think just being able to, to keep going over i mean when i had my 27 million dollar venture capital deal that fell through that was in 2008 and here i am still working on it so i'd say and I, I would say that stems from, I've had a lot of experiences that we can go in in a, in a later interview of uh, near-death experiences. 
And so in these experiences, I have witnessed my whole past life of this life and other lives like flash before my eyes and going up, floating up to the light. But what people don't talk about as much, you know, we probably heard that before a little bit. But what I also saw was what I was supposed to do that I, I didn't get a chance yet to do. And I was like, oh, oh no, like I'm going to have to come back and start over again. And if anything, that's what grounded me to come, like, come back down from the light and be like, no, I am not done here yet. Yeah. I still have a, a whole life planned out to do and a lot of people to help and, and sustainability to, to uh, emphasize to the whole, whole world. And I can't go yet. And so I guess this staying power, you know, is, and that relates to sustainability. Nice. But then in the movie... I got some other superpowers, but we won't go into that. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it for you. Well, no, I think no I. I think yes. I think I can speak for everyone when I say that we would a like to have some spoilers of the movie. Okay, okay. next next go around, and b what a tremendous story that you have with, you know, your near death experiences and. I would also like to hear more about those. So maybe we can have another conversation about that in the future. Definitely. I um, personally just wanted to give my my two cents here as we wrap up this interview. I want to say thank you guys so much for your time tonight and letting me, you know, host this interview session with you, Noodle and I, rather. <laughs> he really wanted to interview you because he wasn't there. He put on and a special he, PJs. And, and he could smell Matt and Jenny's dogs on us when we got <laughs> home. And he was like, where were you? <laughs> so that's why we're having this interview. No. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. It really sheds a lot of light on what the whole project really means and the bigger picture, which I think is not um, conveyed enough with people who have these passion projects. So thank you so much for being here and I appreciate your time. You're welcome. For sure. Happy to help. Rave on. And I, I think one of the tendencies is to see a DJ up on stage and go, oh, they're just trying to be cool. Right. Um, they're just making music because it's fun or they like to party. Uh, but for us, it, we love all those things too. But for us, there's this deeper meaning that we explain on this interview. And that's what keeps us going. Because if it was just about partying and looking cool and egotistical type of things, which aren't necessarily bad. Ego is not bad. It just needs to be balanced with a purpose, a mission, and a why. If it was about being cool and instant success, we would have definitely jumped off the boat a long time ago. <laughs> So I think the the longevity in it, I mean, when I started doing this, I had like finger length cut hair and it was gelled and <laughs> it was... Uh, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, so... Tell me more about that. Were you wearing popped collars? I popped a few collars. Nice. I think we both came from think, that kind of background. Oh my goodness, I've, that's really... We're going to have to reach out to your parents to see if there's some proof. But yeah, there is, there is proof. There is <laughs> yeah. proof. There's proof. But yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why I'm so connected to my long hair is because it, when I see it and I see myself in the mirror, I see myself on videos or in pictures, It's it's my dedication to this project and to my passions in life. And that's why it's always been hard for me to, to not, or to do things that weren't this is because I know that the hair kind of limits your options of what you can do. <laughs> Most do jobs that. want you to have short hair. Yeah. I mean, and I, 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 I still hear it from my mom. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so it definitely, it shows my dedication to this project and, how serious I am about it. So when people compliment it, it's awesome. Don't touch it, please. It's the weirdest thing ever. But yeah, compliments are always, always welcome. And now I have a challenge, breaking the fourth wall here. I have a challenge for you out there in the internet land. If you like this interview and you have a question, comment below on the video or send us a direct message and we'll answer your question in the next interview. Cool.
think that was yeah. really fun. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind doing that once a week. 